Hi, everyone. Welcome to Michael Matthew Foundational Health. I'm really excited to be shooting our second in a series of videos about oxalate toxicity. And I'm really happy to be joined by my dear friend, Sally K. Norton. And Sally is uh, becoming, she's become uh, one of the world's experts in oxalate toxicity. And you can see behind her, the cover for her book, Toxic Superfoods, which is coming out on December 27th at anywhere you can buy books. So welcome, Sally, for video number two. What are oxalates? So we're going to talk about what are oxalates today. Oxalates, oxalates are often talked in the plural. Oxalates are naturally occurring compounds that are start as an acid. So an acid has multiple forms. The acid likes to grab minerals and forms what's technically called a salt. And those salts can crystallize. And we see a lot of calcium oxalate crystals in nature because calcium and oxalate adore each other. And you can put them together really nicely and they make really hard crystals. Plants love oxalic acid. They like to make it. There's a lot of it around. The funguses in the soil make it. And they make it because they need it that's actually when they're making vitamin C and they often make vitamin C so they can make oxalic acid. In many plants, it's the first step to make oxalic acid is to first make ascorbic acid. So there's acids like malic acid, citric acid, oxalic acid, these acids in nature, right? So acids tend to leave acidity and they have some degree of reactivity. Oxalate's pretty reactive with minerals and plants need it for lots of different things. It helps them manage calcium because they're grown in soils that are high calcium and too much calcium can be toxic to plants. So they can use the oxalic acid to set aside the calcium and make it not interact with their metabolism. So it's a way of sort of discarding it. And trees are very clever at this. They discard calcium in their bark. So they form these boxy crystals and put it in the bark. It's like poop, it's like pooping out calcium, getting it's a waste product to get rid of the calcium but it's oh so useful in bark because otherwise the bark would be easily drilled into by beetles and other boring insects. So you've got this barrier. That same barrier is being formed in seeds as well. It can create little oxalate crystals around the edge of a seed and it helps give a hardness and a solidity and it helps probably helps it with dormancy, but it's another way to deliberately store calcium because calcium is a cofactor on enzymes. Minerals help to run enzyme reactions. That's what makes the, these molecules work. They have vitamins and minerals, and so you need this calcium. So when a seed germinates, it can take the calcium oxalate crystal, dissolve it back down because they have the power to do that. Not all organisms can do this, but plants can go back and forth, forming calcium oxalate crystals and undoing them and do this all the time. So they and is that, is that an enzymatic reaction, Sally? That, yes. that dissolve it? Yes, they have and they have enzymes that degrade calcium oxalate, enzymes that both build oxalate and degrade it. Oxalic acid, build it up and drop it down. So they, they do lots of smart things. So it's making seeds um, sturdy and digestible and um, hard, makes germination possible because it's storing the calcium you need later. In leaves, the, the plants can use the oxalic acid to fight funguses by turning it into peroxide, which is an antifungal chemical. You, you know, hydrogen peroxide, we use it for infections and in, in, you know, in medicine. Um, plants also build this scaffolding with amino acids and deliberate shapes of the scaffolding so that the calcium oxalate will stick to these amino acids. And it builds very specific shapes like the raphide shape, which is a double pointed toothpick or arrow in these bundles, like quiverfuls of arrows. In the very toxic plants, these crystals have barbed tips, not just a simple tip, and they have grooves up the middle of them. And the grooves hold oxalic acid and proteases and other chemicals. So it's a way of having a poison tip arrow in the most toxic plants. We don't eat those, we call those inedible or poisonous and toxic, which by the way, if you think about all the plants in your mall, in your yard, in your woods, in your house, none of them are edible. <laughs> and that's because plants produce a lot of chemicals, including this calcium oxalate and oxalic acid. 
which is quite deadly. In fact, there's a, a several reports in the medical literature about a house plant called Diffenbachia, which is called dumb cane, because the oxalate and the crystals, both the uh, rapide crystals, which dumb cane can literally shoot these, this quiver full of arrows, shoot, shoot, shoot. It literally propels them when you've damaged the tissue by biting on it. You get a little sap. One drop of sap from the Diffenbachia plant or the dumb cane plant can literally paralyze the vocal cords. That's why it's called dumb cane. And what's doing that is the immune reaction to those crystals and that oxalic acid. So the crystals are delivering proteases. The crystals are actually penetrating the membranes of the mouth and throat by a cell or two cells. They can go two cells deep, these arrows. Um, and that's, so that's really ugly. So you don't eat Diffenbachia. You <laughs> don't let your dogs or children eat them. You'll end up in the emergency room. This one guy's whole mouth was ulcerated, tongue and throat and everything. And he couldn't speak for nine days. He had to stay in the hospital from one drop of sap for, um, I don't know if it was two weeks, some long period of time. So, so it's, it's, it's not just mechanical damage then. It's not just a spear penetrating the cell that does no, all the damage. Is it, is awesome. it, it, it's delivering these, these other chemicals. So it's kind of like a poison spear. Yes. Right. Yeah. So the enzymes are called proteases. We think we need to eat these enzymes, but in fact, if those enzymes go straight on your tissues, they just eat your tissues. Like, no, we make enzymes for digestion and then we make enzymes where we need them. You don't willy nilly put enzymes on your sores in your mouth, but that's what the plan has figured out it can do. Um, so, but it's really the, immune's re the immune reaction to the damage. The immune system is going, holy cow, something is ripping up our mouth and throat. And it, comes after it to protect you from infection and protect you from you know, this invasion. It keeps you alive. But that inflammation makes it impossible to breathe or talk for a long time because inflammation is, has side effects. So you don't want to call up the war zone or the army of, of immune cells to protect you from death from infection that could cause, would be caused secondarily. If you keep brushing up all your barrier function cells that line your mouth and throat with these crystals and this acid and the proteases, you would die from infection. But in fact, the immune system protects you from that, but it can be an ugly experience. So that's another example. So it's not just the, these arrows that the plants make. Like I mentioned before, in the bark, they're blocks. And in a very, um, plants that grow in shady environments tend to make these, what I call disco balls, they're called druses. And the druses, all these different plates all form together and kind of forms a mass. It's a ball shape that reflects light in all directions. And the theory there is that the light is now bouncing around inside the vacuole of the cell in the plant. So it's capturing all the light. The light just doesn't bounce off the leaf in the shade. You can get every little photon of light bouncing inside the cell. So you get all the light you can as a shade plant so you can grow in the shade. And so they're thinking that's one of the uses of the druses. So plants are making oxalic acid to deal with infections and low light. They also deal with high heat and, and dry air. It helps them to survive desert. So desert plants tend to have a lot of it. Agave and cactus is very high in oxalate and oxalate crystals. So plants need it to survive. It's part of their basic metabolism. It's part of their reproductive cycle. It's part of their defensive cycles. It's part of their just managing chemistry that they're growing in. So plants are doing this for themselves. They're not 100% in your corner. They're not doing everything just to be your lunch. That's not their plan. They were here before we were, by the way. And if they were doing everything so we could eat them, we would have, we and the deer and the bunnies and the rabbits and the funguses would have made them extinct. And so any plants that weren't defending themselves don't exist anymore. Right. So just because we put spinach in our garden bed in our backyard doesn't mean it's safe for us. Right. And the science has shown that for a long time, and we'll probably get into that in a future talk. But we've we've known that eating spinach, especially giving it to children, causes severe calcium deficiencies that are quite dangerous for children. So getting back to what oxalates are, this chemical, this little acid is tiny. It's two carbons. That's tiny with four oxygens, which is a lot of oxygen, which is sort of hmm, oxidative. It's very pro-oxidative molecule because it's so reactive. 
it's very versatile. It can do different things in different environments and can mess up lots of different things, especially mineral metabolism in cells, which has lots of side effects, you know, affects gene expression. Like if you don't have the cofactors on certain enzymes, that affects which genes you're reading or whether you can make certain proteins or not. It affects how enzymes work or don't work. It can block enzymes. It can cause electrolyte disturbances and cell signaling inside of cells and between cells. It's really mocking with the basic function of cells because of its ability to interfere with these minerals. It is a chelating acid that's messing with mineral ions in cells. That makes it very versatile in the way it can affect you, but it's also happening at this very low level way down there in the cells that's sneaky, tricky, stealthy. These things are happening and it doesn't get the blame. And then we're busy justifying eating high oxalate foods. And we're making that stealthy, tricky, sneaky, criminal behavior we're giving total permission because we're, we, the establishment, are quite willing to ignore the toxicity of oxalate. So we're not even paying attention to it on purpose. And hence, people like me and yourself got in big doo doo, <laughs> wrecked our spines, wrecked our bodies, wrecked our health, lost a lot of productivity. Because the toxicity of oxalate, we could not notice, we didn't know it was our diet doing this to us. No one warned us the degree of the potential for the, the downstream effects of eating something that's toxic, that's sucking minerals, disturbing electrolytes, messing with your gene expression, messing with metabolism in cells, and ruining enzymes, ruining membranes and mitochondria. That's the, the factory that helps to generate energy that cells work on. This is happening and yet we weren't warned and we're told to eat these foods and you can't really tell that your achy joints or your slow brain or your fatigue or your your stomach pain or your belching or your hiccups or your osteopenia have anything to do with how you're eating. Yeah, we all thought we were um plants were going to save us. And uh, I've heard you say a number of times that you got so enamored with um, using diet as a way of keeping yourself well. And I did as well. I thought, you know, when I started learning some basic nutrition, I just thought, oh my God, you know, the plants are here. They're going to, they're going to keep us well and from all these nasty diseases. And then only to find out at 55 that that was totally wrong it's so tragic i mean most of us who are trying so hard for our nutrition buying organic seeds growing organic seeds buying the best stores getting it fresh cooking it within a few days making sure it's at its best and having a complete meal with a, a protein a salad two vegetables and all of this stuff and then really you know making that you know figuring it all out so you can still have a job and everything and in the meantime you don't feel good and you're tired and everything's an effort and it's not going well and you can't possibly believe at the time that all the things you're doing right aren't working why don't we notice that i don't know because we don't we don't realize that natural foods naturally contain naturally toxic compounds, especially plants. Now, animals don't need to be all defensive with crystals and acids because they have teeth, legs, they can run away. They have claws and hooves and ways to be fierce and way to look fierce. I mean, a dog will growl. A plant can't growl and say, get away, don't bite me. A dog will tell you in no uncertain terms that you are not to take a bite out of his ass. You know, <laughs> a plant can't do that. So these little oxalic acid molecules that we can get into our bodies, which uh, when it comes in that form, we call it soluble oxalate. Is that correct? That's right. So oxalic yep. acid is called soluble oxalate. And yep. calcium oxalate is called insoluble. And so that can easily get absorbed through our digestive tract and then get into the bloodstream. Um, when it's in the bloodstream, can it, directly pass through cell membranes 
or is there some way it still needs to be transported in? It's generally believed that it's since it's dissolved as an ion in the watery fraction, and that's why it can just float in. And the more watery it is, the easier it is to get in the body. So the more you dilute it with like almond milk or whip it up into a smoothie with juice and stuff in it, the more you do that, the more that soluble ion is moving around. So it's, it's some cells are just wide open to it, like the liver, because the liver has to filter everything you're eating. So after you eat it, it goes straight to the liver. And those cells are open sinusoidal cells where you're flooding the cells themselves with all this stuff from the body. So it's quite harsh on them, but the liver cells cleverly are great at making glutathione. And so they protect themselves for the most part after meals, except that you're using up a lot of glutathione and it makes it harder and harder for the liver to do all its other detox, its detox work. It's not detoxing oxalate. So I de you know, we think that it's a transporter that moves oxalic acid across cell membranes. That these are, there's a, like a, you know, the circular revolving door you see in a big building downtown in a city. It, it's kind of that kind of revolving door that can move oxalic acid ion in, but it has to have another ion on the other side of the door. So two people have to be in that circular door at the same time or two ions. And so it'll exchange bicarbonate or something else, sulfur or whatever. There's other partners that where it can go back and forth. So cells that have these transporters are more likely to pick up oxalate, but it seems to get into cells anyway, whether there's transporters there or not and can cross barriers. Like we've seen in studies where there's transporters were knocked out, genetically knocked out of animals in the gut, in the colon. So you take out this gene so that this, the animals don't have the transporters and you still see oxalic acid moving into the colon space when the bacteria are there. There's a certain um, enzyme bacteria that make the enzymes can eat oxalate. Some, there's one bacteria that likes oxalate as its main, main dish all the time. And when you have more of that present, it's more likely to move across the membrane. So somehow oxalate is moving around and getting into cells in ways we don't even fully understand. So Sally, it, it seems like for new people that they're going to hear this and say, but we've been eating these plants for so long, you know, really, is it really a problem? Yeah, really, it's a problem because our, our bodies are built to take small amounts of oxalate. We, we can handle oxalate. We're very physiologically, the body knows about oxalic acid and crystals and all this stuff. And it has mechanisms for dealing with it. The kidneys excrete it, but there's an upper limit to it. And the upper limit is pretty low compared to how we eat. So, you know, the science says for people who have health, which means your gut is not inflamed and leaky, and your kidneys are good and they're working well and they can get rid of oxalate well, you can tolerate about 150 to 200 milligrams of oxalate a day, which if you divide that into three meals, 50 to 70 milligrams a day is what we're built to take, or a meal rather, maybe, maybe let's call it 70 for, you can handle 70 in a meal. But, you know, that is uh, not necessarily that you can handle it every meal, every day of your life. And unfortunately, what's happening now is that we are eating that level every day, every meal, all the time, and worse. Because one spinach salad, just a kind of medium spinach salad, probably has between 450 and 550 milligrams of oxalate. Oh, well, that's like three times more than what you're designed to handle in an entire day, let alone one meal, okay? And then if you go ahead and have a handful of almonds, you could easily be up to 75 or 100 milligrams of oxalate on a mitt full of almonds or a mitt full of chocolate chips. So like there's foods that we love that are really exceeding our capacity. And not just that, but we tend to now have them available all the time. It used to be when we'd eat these foods, it would be in the spring when spinach was around for a few weeks and it wouldn't be every night of the week and it wouldn't be for breakfast. People used to have eggs and pancakes and bacon for breakfast. They never ate spinach smoothies. No one could afford almonds, almond bread or almond milk until very recently. No, we have not been eating like this for a long time. And it doesn't matter if we were or not because you get damaged even in the olden days. Like there are skeletons from 
prehistoric times showing severe damage in the oral cavity from a high oxalate diet. There's some ancient Texans who lived in the desert eating agave and cactus, those high oxalate desert plants. And the, the crystals wore out their molars. By the time they were 25, they didn't have any molars left. And by the time they were 40, they didn't have any teeth at all. And the studies tend to blame the crystals that they're eating because the crystals are so hard, it wears down the enamel. But teeth are maintained from the inside. And it's more than just the enamel wearing out, although that's a major thing. You can literally wear down your teeth with these crystals. That's how hard they are. But the acid that's getting into your bloodstream is getting into your saliva and your blood. There is blood flowing into your jaw and your teeth, quite a bit of it. And the teeth and jaw both are full of calcium and other minerals. So this is a magnet of activity and blood flow. And you can get from the saliva additional oxalate, you get oxalate flowing into the teeth area. So it's both from the inside and the outside. So the crystals get you on the outside, wear out your teeth and your, your mucous membranes and probably promote leaky gut. And then the oxalate gets in so easily when you have leaky gut, we can talk about that too. And then you've got oxalic acid in your bloodstream after meals for eight to 10 hours. And it gets particularly bad at about the four hour mark. So I believe that it was more than the crystals causing these people's teeth to fall out. It was the acid itself in this food as well. Well, and, and can't the crystals work their way into the bone matrix as well of the teeth? So then, well, and then they possibly, they oh, they, so okay. So that's the point of confusion. Like, so you eat the crystals, but the crystals don't just like show up in your bloodstream and then stick on your teeth. It's the acid that takes the calcium out of your teeth or your blood or your cells and starts crystallizing in place. So it's, it's the acid gets into that tissue, the tooth, the whatever, and then it starts crystallizing and attracting more and more oxalate and can build into these crystals. So crystals start forming. That's what a kidney stone is. It's uh, building up. We get, we get them in our thyroid gland. We get them all over, even with healthy kidneys, even without leaky gut, but chances are with leaky gut, more of that acid can get in. So with the healthy gut, maybe 10 or 15% of the acid can get into the bloodstream. Uh, with leaky gut, maybe 50, 60 or more percent can get in that. So you don't even need to eat spinach to get yourself with too much oxalate in the body when you've got leaky gut. And so with it getting into the teeth like that and doing the effects you just discussed, oh, oh, the end point is that those teeth can become more brittle, isn't it? They can become weaker. They become weaker, that's right. They, yeah. Because the, in the bone matrix and in the teeth matrix, you've basically got particulate crystals that are destroying the architecture of that material. So it simultaneously is setting up stuff that seems hard and you can have a normal bone density scan because these are contributing to the hardness factor, but they're disrupting the architecture of the bone, making them quite brittle and weak. Because you get cracked teeth easily and so on, something is destroying the structure of that material of your teeth. And oxalate is such a commonly consumed food. I mean, you're eating foods that are so full of it with peanut butter and potatoes and chocolate and spinach and raspberries and blackberries. And now people do turmeric like crazy no no we didn't do this we didn't do smoothies we didn't do turmeric tea we didn't pig out on these foods so more and more of us are in trouble with oxalate but oxalate has been a problem for a long time it's been toxic forever it's never been great for us it's just that right now um people are promoting a spinach smoothie or a spinach this or that when it doesn't give you calcium and in fact is toxic and that's the problem that we're not being told we're not given the, the full story. We're, we're so concerned that processed foods are harming us. And that so we're completely embracing if it's whole, organic, fresh, whole food, it's fine. Completely ignoring the toxicity for the cause of like getting off of junk food. And it doesn't have to be either or. I mean, there's plenty of other foods that aren't toxic with oxalate. The lettuces, even kale isn't that high in oxalate. Um, the, the whole cabbage family, which includes watercress and turnips and rutabaga and 
all kinds of foods, those are not that high in oxalates. So there's certainly whole foods that you can eat, but I mean, human beings have been refining rice and grains for a long time because the bran is so indigestible and is high in oxalate and toxins that it's you're better off often. That's why the Asians eat white rice and have for so long. Like there's a certain degree of refining, like plants require some processing to be digestible at all and to be safe and edible. And we, we've forgotten that. And we think unprocessed and whole is better. So we're promoting whole root turmeric while curcumin has very little oxalate. And if you insist on eating turmeric, have the curcumin, which doesn't have the, the crystals and the acid get taken out in the process of refining it. So there's ways around it, it's, but it takes a little patience to slow down and think about this and be open to the actual facts. And we don't have patience anymore. We want quick, easy bumper sticker solutions. And that is working against us in the long run, unfortunately. It's, it always fascinates me some of the ways food is developed in cultures over time. And so making white rice um, was helpful because it gets rid of the oxalates, but it also gets rid of some of the B vitamins. And when they made white rice years ago, they, they it took them a long time to figure out they created vitamin B1 deficiencies. So it's, it's an interesting game that, that kind of has gotten created here. Well, you know, white rice is just a for source of carbohydrate basically this, you're not going to get the B vitamins from refined grain. Grains have never been a great source of nutrition bran or not. You know, you, it, it may, it's the same problem with the spinach. It looks like it has minerals and nutrients there, but how truly can the body use it? And then there's these tannins and polyphenols that interfere with digestion and make them hard to digest. And you know, one reason adding more plants to your diet helps you to lose weight is because you can't digest your food as well. It's a, like a little bit of bariatric surgery without having to do the surgery. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, is there, is there, before we summarize, is there any other points you want to make or uh, bring up around oxalates? Well, it, we really do need to see this as a form of poisoning, as a toxicity, and stop thinking of it as a, oh, a sensitivity. We don't actually think about being poisoned. Yeah. We, we, we're oh, okay. to, like, some people can't have gluten because they're sensitive to it. It's an allergy of some kind. It's an intolerance. Well, it's, there's variabilities in your tolerance level in terms of when and how the, the problems that Oxley may be creating for your physiology and your tissues it may take you longer to, to have symptoms or to start to feel problems, or, you know, but that doesn't mean they're not happening below the radar. Most disease is going to happen what we call subclinically, where you don't see a lot of symptoms. And then we're not used to identifying these symptoms relative to our diet anyway. So um, it's, it's sort of subclinical and it doesn't mean it's not happening below the radar. The body's doing everything it can to keep you high functioning. So you survive. And so it's going to not complain for a long time until you reach a breaking point. And when you reach a breaking point, it can be pretty bad. And you, uh, I know you've told this story a bunch of times, but just to give people an idea of the level of toxicity we're talking about, can you tell the Barcelona sorrel soup story? Yeah, so this man was uh, in his 50s and very overweight, had a lifetime of alcohol addiction, and he ate a bunch of sorrel soup, probably, you know, three or four cups of sorrel soup, and he ended up dead a few hours later in the emergency room. Um, he, he went in there, you know, with arrhythmias and all this, they had to hook him up with, a, you know, respirator and everything and did everything they could to save him, but the oxalate in that sorrel soup killed him. Um, and I have a feeling that what was happening there was he was going for all that sorrel soup because he was trying to make up for the fact that he can't get over the drinking. And he maybe he had a big bender for a couple of days ago and he's trying to get healthy and reform himself. It's like one more, one more decision. I'm going to get healthy. I'm going to beat this thing. I'm going to save myself. And, and this is the frightening piece. This is so important, a good place to land this discussion on is that the more frail and sick you are, the less able you are to handle the toxin. 
So if you're really sick, if you have kidney issues, diabetes, any kind of vulnerability, you're the last person who should be doing the spinach smoothies, the sorrel soup, and these high oxalate bombs like almond bread and almond everything. So protect the frail, the youth, the elder, the sick person from toxins. And oxalate would be a number one toxin to be aware of. Don't serve dark chocolate fudge brownies in nursing homes. Don't keep giving the nursing home residents sweet potato fries. These things are not good choices for sick people. Or white potatoes. Or chocolate and chocolate milk. The list goes on and on. The list goes on, you know, and it's... Uh, I would, um, I personally would really like to protect anybody who's institutionalized and don't have control over their food from, don't give them the only choice as a brownie and teach them that this could make their arthritis worse, their back pain worse, their dementia worse, their Parkinson's disease. All of these things that are taking people out can be caused or promoted by high oxalate foods. My dad is in a nursing home now with uh, Parkinson's diagnosis and dementia. And he's at a place where I can't talk to him about it because it just, just doesn't get in there. And, and there's no point in talking to the veterans association where he's staying because they won't buy it. So it's, it's a really sad place to, to have discovered in myself at a time when at least I can make some corrections and, so, and healing is happening for me, but it's really sad that it, there's nothing I can really do with my dad now. And, and to know oxalates is, is probably is a pretty big factor in his health. Once you see this in yourself and you can see it in your family, you can see it around you where no one else can see it. And so it's a painful place to be, to feel like there's a way to help people and they're not helpable. For, yeah. for a number of reasons, you know, and when I was visiting my mom and her retirement community this summer, she did get the big fudge brownie. She had two small bites of it. She did have a bite of sweet potato fry. And then we took her to the store and she could barely get out of the car because her hip arthritis was flaring an hour and a half after she had that meal. I'm like, mom, the brownie, she said, I didn't have that much of it. That's not it. You know, dismissing it. We all mm -hmm. want to dismiss this. Yeah. Free to dismiss it if you want, but if you really, if you really don't want to be a crippled, hobbled old person who needs help for the basic functions of life, look out for oxalate because this can be a really sneaky enemy. You really don't want it undermining your life, truly. But all we can do is offer the information, and, and yep. someday we'll be in a position to reform the, this ignorance in our institutions. Yeah. Um, so to summarize, um, one way I like looking at things is, is plants have been here for forever. They have are wonderful chemical factories. That's why they've been used for medicines for hundreds and hundreds of years, thousands of years. And uh, they're not here to necessarily support us at all. They're here to take care of themselves. And there are chemical compounds that are poisonous to um, all different critters. But in speaking about humans, there are plant compounds that are toxic for us. And oxalates in my study and in your study, I've heard you say it, they seem to be the worst of the ones out there because um, they can cause immediate damage. But if you eat more than your body can handle in a day, your body's forced to put them into storage. And the storage can happen over decades. And it's not just about, it's, it's, and, and since we don't eat seasonally anymore, we're not giving our bodies the break to clear this stuff out. It's pollution, Michael. We're polluting not just the teeth and bones and ruining their structure. We're polluting our glands and our tissues. This is a disaster to have particulate nanoparticles forming in your tissues. This is the worst. And then we'll get into this later about how that creates long-term immune system problems that you don't need. Yeah. Yeah. So plants do things for us. They produce oxygen. They make, they give us shade. They make the world beautiful. They produce the most interesting diversity and 
and just spiritual food for us, not to mention ox oxygen, like we're breathing because plants are producing oxygen for us. That's food. That's the best food we can get from them. And they're giving us soul food too. So I love plants. I've been a plant nut. I'm a big gardener. Um, I, I went through a bit of a heartbreak with my garden <laughs> over this in 2014. I could barely make myself garden. And I started cutting down the fig trees. And now my garden is back to all pretty much pretty much all um botanicals that are you know beautiful not so much about the food anymore yeah and we're not saying it's worth saying we're not saying that all plants are bad for us it's just some and that's what we need to get educated on and that's part of the purpose of these videos is to help ed people educate themselves so they can make well-informed choices and right. we'll be getting in a, in a forthcoming video, maybe the next one, we'll be getting into what are the foods that are high in oxalates and what are the foods that are low? Then you can curate a diet that's much safer and yeah. enjoy it. Yeah, yeah. cool. Yeah. Be fun. Any last words of wisdom, Sally, before we end? Oh, I don't know. Please, please just notice that <laughs> oxalates aren't good for you and you don't need these foods. And, and give yourself a little bit of freedom to think about it. Um, you know, we're, we, we, we're, we're told that these things are so good for us all the time. And it's, it's hard to swim upstream, but if you could please use our ruined bodies as a little bit of inspiration, then go for it. Yay. <laughs> Let us be the wreck to, to be the warning. And do we, do you want to share where people can find you quick, Sally? I'll yeah, include I'll include it in the show notes. Thank you. The website is Sally K. Norton. Please sign up for the, the email list there so I can send you some updates. And I'm not real great about sending out emails um, consistently, but if if you want to stay in touch with things, sign up there. And um, I'm on Instagram too. That's not the greatest place to reach out to me, but it, find me there as well. And then um, check out the book. If you can, if you can get a hold of the book, it'll really give you a chance to think about this clearly and help someone else. Because chances are, you know, somebody with a neurological problem, an arthritis problem, an osteoporosis problem, uh, a dementia issue, whatever, or, you know, prone to these things, fibromyalgia, there's lots of things that can, oxalate can be part of it. So if you, if you want to help someone else, you may want to have the book in your hand for that. All right, everyone. Thanks for being here. Um, and uh, check out Sally and uh, we'll keep bringing forth some more videos here to, to fill in this topic of oxalate toxicity. Thank you. Definitely. Thank you. Follow Michael Matthews Foundational Health. Be sure to click like, subscribe, and definitely get that notification button going.